Hey everybody, it's Joe Deganzik, and this is part two of our home automation CES coverage, Internet of Things, Smart Home, whatever you want to call it, for 2016. In part one, we talked about a number of uh, sort of news bits and products coming out of CES, a couple of things that were off the wall. Also talked about Samsung, Smart Things, Hub integration, their new TVs, uh, smart TVs and whatnot. You can uh, click that button to check out the first episode. We're going to talk a number uh, about a number of other stories. A few of them are going to be kind of rapid fire um, product information and just bits that I think um, are inform are interesting uh, that you should know about uh, coming out of CES in the realm of smart home, home automation, Internet of Things, you know that whole thing. So one of the stories um, <clears throat> is about energy harvesting devices. Now this sounds something like out of a sci-fi movie, but really they're they're actually real. And we're talking about two different, actually about three different brands. One company called Enerby, and they're out of Europe. Um, they're working on these energy harvesting little devices, sensors, transmitters, receivers, and they're pulling the energy out of a couple different ways, out of motion, you know, action. Uh, they might be doing it off of ambient light, which, you know, you could sort of Think back to the old solar cell calculators. But this is really important. And if you're wondering if we've seen anything like this, like you know how to press a button on something and have it not need a battery, that's the bottom line. That's the killer app. Getting all these little things that are going to connect our homes and connect our devices, but we don't need batteries for them. We don't need to keep producing batteries and replacing them and recharging them. If only we could capture this energy somehow of pressing buttons or turning knobs, well, people have already done it. We've seen the commercialization of this. Uh, actually, companies have done this for a number of years, but Philips um, sort of made some waves um, by actually, actually introducing a product to control uh, their Philips Hue lights uh, like this one, their BR30 lamp, they introduced, and I don't have it in my hand, sorry, um, they introduced the, the Hue Tap, which is basically a tap device, uh, a tap device, it's a remote control um, that you can stick to the wall or anywhere, and based on the, you're pushing the button, it's using piezo or piezo electricity, that tiny little amount of energy and force required to push that button actually transmits this signal. And they're basically doing that by harnessing that push, you know, that kinetic energy. And that's what's really important. We've got to get these devices that don't need batteries and there's going to be a lot of them, billions upon billions of these tiny little remotes, transmitters, sensors, specifically things that can pick up sound, things that can pick up any type of signal in our smart homes or in our environments, and they have to get those signals out somewhere, and they really should be done without batteries. And that is a total win that is fantastic. It's like we're living in the future. We can press buttons, we can have stuff happen, and we don't even need batteries for it to happen. Totally cool. Another interesting development, it's a product, you might not be able to use it because it really only works with their system, but it's an interesting development and we might see other manufacturers um, do a take on this on their own products. This is a dimmer, it's a dimmer add-on from a company called Fibaro, or is it Fibaro? It's an add-on so you can take an existing light switch and wire this dimmer module in, not only will it um, figure out what type of uh, lighting device you have connected and do all this fancy stuff and communicate via Z-Wave uh, back to their proprietary hub, but you wire it in line. So you, you could actually use your existing switch if you like it and not have to replace the switch with something else. So it's a dimmer module. Actually, it has multiple functions uh, with you know flipping the, uh, the toggle back on and off, or if you actually have a momentary toggle switch, Pretty interesting stuff. Again, it only works with the Fibaro, or is it Fibaro, um, system, but something to watch for, and other manufacturers might adopt this to make actually adding dimmers and other smart technology to your light switches even easier while keeping your light switch actually physically the same. You've probably heard about it, so we had to cover it at least for 30 seconds. The Samsung Family Hub Fridge. It's a product that takes four words to describe it. That's right, it's this fridge from Samsung with the gigantic screen on the front, gigantic touch screen. You can order groceries, you can remotely see what's in the fridge with multiple cameras, and it's probably $85,000 and no one needs it. But you know, good on Samsung for bringing it out. Actually, we don't know how much it's going to cost or when it'll be available, but sometime this year. And of course, it'll be internet connected, and there'll be an app for that. 
And that's all I'm going to say about that. And yes, big ass fans with big ass prices. They came on the board, uh, came on the scene a couple years ago with very expensive fans. Now they look really cool. They have integrated lighting. They've got a lot of smarts to them, but they've been like a thousand dollars or more. So now they've introduced the Haiku, that's their style, their actual uh, line of fans, the Haiku L series, as I'm calling it, the low priced series, as it's about half the price, roughly four to four hundred fifty dollars. Beautiful fans, a couple different variants of uh, finishes, and including an LED light. But if you want the smarts that they took out of it, the smart um, the smarts are now going to be in a little control panel that you put on the wall, like sensing and Wi-Fi control and whatnot. Yeah, but that's still going to set you back like $125 or $150. So then it's going to be over $500 anyways. I, that's great and all, but I just think that's really expensive for a ceiling fan when you could retrofit your own ceiling fan with some kind of home automation controller for maybe about 70 or 80 bucks and not spend money on a whole new fan. Oh well. Anyways, if you like paying big ass prices or even half big ass prices, go with big ass fans. Analytics, analytics, analytics. You're hearing this word probably a lot, especially this year from CES, and you're probably wondering what the heck it means. What is it? Why are they talking about analytics and home automation and video surveillance and whatnot? And you probably understand analytics if you do anything on the web in terms of developing websites, looking at YouTube stats, things like that. It's just looking at data and analyzing it, thus analytics. What does it have to do with home automation? Well, anytime we do anything, even if it's, hey Siri, um, and doing voice control, that's analytics. Um, they are, our devices are analyzing our voices. They could be analyzing images. They could be doing anything. And it's huge now. The reason being, of course, because of mobile devices and these tiny and incredibly powerful chipsets, we can actually do analytics on the fly as we've now been able to do voice control on our mobile devices, but also with doing video. And there's a number of companies that are taking advantage of this for facial recognition, for things such as looking at the environment for uh, thermal imaging, fire detection, all of this kind of stuff. So that's one of the other trends that we're seeing out of CES. We've got a couple products we're going to mention uh, in just a moment that will tell you more about how they're using good old analytics. It's the smart version of this battery, the good old 9-volt battery, with a funny name. The Roost 9-volt battery uses analytics to help you deal with those annoying chirping smoke detectors, assuming that they're only battery powered, but we'll talk about that if we uh, once we actually review the product. Anyways, they're using analytics to detect sound. So if the smoke alarm goes off, you can actually um, get an alert, even if you're not home via your connected device, smartphone. And of course, if your alarm, uh, if your smoke alarm is purely battery powered, the smart nine volt battery will simply cut the power to allow you to silence it if it's powered by um, electricity and battery, well, not so much. That's one example of someone who's doing something with analytics in sound. Is it a bird at the door? Then maybe it's time to answer it. No, it's Doorbird, yet another one of these video doorbells. Pretty much does the same thing, although it's pretty large. Looks much larger and kind of not as refined as uh, Skybell, Ring, and any of the other solutions that are out there. And it's 350 bucks, so it'll be more expensive. They, however, unlike the other guys, are doing facial recognition. So you could get an alert, say, if it detected motion and someone did at your front door, and it could tell you if it's one of your friends, of course, if you had registered your friends uh, either via Facebook or some kind of photo library, um, or if it's someone that you don't know, the delivery person or maybe a burglar is coming to stop by for a visit. Probably not stopping by for a visit. But anyways, um, the Doorbird, again, $350, kind of more expensive, kind of larger, and with facial recognition, I don't know if you're going to spend $150 more for that feature. But again, they're using analytics. Again, um, there's that word again, <laughs> with video to detect um, things such as facial recognition and give you alerts on it. And it's the remote that could solve all of your problems. Well, maybe. The Seven Hugs Smart Remote, because of course you want your remote control to hug you, um, is context aware. And it's only context aware because of these smart sockets that you have to place somewhere around your home. What these things look like, we have no idea. Smart socket, so perhaps it's a screw-in type thing and you screw light bulbs into it and it's a 
pass through and it's doing some sort of Bluetooth sensing or some type of proprietary sensing so that the remote, when you point it at something and you train it, then it knows where it's pointing. Of course, if you move the object, you're going to have to retrain it. But anyways, the concept is uh, they're doing analytics based on this um, mesh networking with multiple devices. We've thought of this before. We've talked to you about this kind of thing before, specifically with the Zuli smart plug when you can have that sense technology in three of those. So you're going to have three of these uh, smart sockets. Again, we have no images of this thing, but there uh, we've shown you the image of the remote itself. The concept is you point the remote at the object you want to control and based on remembering where the remote is pointing at, where the object is, the remote will change its interface for changing audio, changing light levels, doing something more interesting than that, turning the TV on and off, changing channels, what have you, should be a really cool universal remote. Assuming it's coming out sometime this year, no pricing, I'm guessing this thing is gonna be at least 150 to $200. And finally, speaking of being first or one of the first, Electrolux, that brand that, well, you thought wasn't even a thing anymore, was like your grandparents' appliance company. Anyways, they're still around, and at least one of their new smart ovens for 2016 will actually be using Google's Brillo technology. No, you can't use the Brillo pad on the smart oven to clean it. Anyways, uh, we made fun of them before for that name. But anyways, uh, Brillo and Weave, very similar to Apple's HomeKit technology. Not really any more details other than that, but this is one of the first products, if not the first product we've heard about, that is actually going to sign on um, to be compatible with Google's technology for the smart home. That's it for this episode, a little bit longer than the previous episode. We kind of broke everything, the rest of the news down. And we have uh, the third episode in the series is going to be dedicated to just the HomeKit product. We saw a number of announcements, but yeah, it's HomeKit is great, but uh, well, we'll talk about it more in that episode. And other than that, um, if you haven't subscribed to Lighting Answers, make sure to subscribe. We cover uh, LED lighting, the connected device, and home automation space. Of course, we also show you some projects about how to use these things all together and, of course, product reviews. That's it. I'm Jody Ganzik for Lighting Answers. I'll see you next time.